Hello, listeners. Jordan here. I just want to let you know that you can listen to Nighttime early and ad-free on Amazon Music. Include it with Prime. You are listening to Canadian Gothic, a series by the Nighttime Podcast. Hello, listeners. This episode is going to take us to the James Smith Cree Nation in Saskatchewan. On September 4th of 2022, this community of just over 2,000 people would become the venue for one of Canada's most horrific moments. Over just a three-hour period, 32-year-old Miles Sanderson would use a knife, a variety of stolen cars, and an unimaginable amount of rage to kill 11 people and injure 18 more. The brutality of his crimes, the manhunt that followed, and the incredible loss of life that occurred has and will forever change the affected communities. Tonight, in the first in a multi-part series, Madeleine Klein and I will attempt to make sense of the Saskatchewan stabbing massacre. Good evening, thanks for joining us. We begin with a developing story, a manhunt currently underway across three provinces. Authorities searching for two suspects believed to be responsible for a deadly stabbing spree in Saskatchewan. The RCMP says at least 10 people are dead with at least 15 others sent to hospital. Ms. Madeleine Klein, you, you don't look so uh, so pale white. You look like you've got some sun. What have you been up to? Oh, really? Good, because I was just going to ask. I forgot to ask if I'm too bright. I thought I looked really white. <laughs> no, you're just you're you're absolutely glowing. Uh, oh, you, like sun kissed. I think they call it. Maybe it has been nice here. So I haven't spent a terrible amount of time outside. No sunblock like the inside of my house. I'm, but, I'm trying uh, to uh, set you up for saying you've been on vacation. Oh, yeah. Well, that was like <laughs> over saw... a week ago. I yeah, saw... but this is our first episode since then. Come on. That's right. Yeah, I was in Phoenix and it was absolutely fabulous. Okay. It was a lot better than Saskatchewan. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's not a lot of work, right? Not really. No, anywhere's better than Saskatchewan. I think I, I believe Cape Breton would be better than Saskatchewan. Ah, I think Cape Breton is like little Saskatchewan. That's what we call it. Oh. Are you serious? <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh. <laughs> but it, we should it, start. Yeah. Ah, here on Little Saskatchewan. <laughs> uh, uh, how How's life been? How are you? It's good. I Yeah, so I was on vacation. My friend uh, is getting married in December, so we went on her stag at. Uh, I turned 30 on Friday, so that was, I had a weekend of celebrations. I'm using my, what does it say? Hello 30 mug <laughs> from my, from my sister-in-law. Oh, that's so, nice. Yeah. 30s no, a really big good. one. I, I I feel like my birthdays that affected me, the 25th was like the first one where I was like, oh my God, I'm actually growing up. It was 25. And then I don't think 30 didn't really do anything. Then 40 was like, oh man, like I'm completely grown up now. Yeah. And lots of people struggle with 30, but I'm not everybody gets the opportunity to age. Mm. So I'm I'm grateful I made it through my 20s. During my early 20s, I wasn't sure I would. Mm -hmm. So I've been yeah. there. Yeah. My, uh... my, my mom says growing old. I, I think I've said this to you before, but I I say it often because it's such a good quote. My mom says, uh, growing old is a privilege denied to many. I love that. Yeah. And she's so right. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, well, let's get into our story because we got... I think what will be our first two or three parter, this is a, a huge, huge epic story in terms of scope, but just big and complicated in terms of details and twists and turns. We're going to be covering a story that's not in your backyard, but not too far from you. I guess we'll title this something like the Saskatchewan stabbing massacre or stabbing rampage, because that's ultimately what it was. This is something that I heard about in the news and I followed it when it was happening, but it just kind of went off my radar until maybe a week or two ago, the police came out and, and released a, they did a press conference where they released the most detailed timeline of this mass stabbing rampage that they're had been yet and that's kind of really opened my eyes to how awful and brutal and vicious this uh, this event is being in saskatchewan as you are what was it like when when this happened it was it was scary 
because I'm only like two, three hours away from where it happened. And when it did happen, the, as we'll learn as we go on, people in Regina got an emergency alert because of how awful this crime was. And the perpetrator was spotted in Regina. Where he was spotted was right near my house. And it was the first emergency alert that I've ever gotten that actually scared me. Mm. I was actually like, kind of worried it was like this is a little bit too close to home yeah and for a while there they really didn't know where he was so the yeah that i could i can understand how that would be concerning it was four days of unknown like Mm -hmm. all we knew was someone someone bad was out there and we could potentially be in danger and when someone thinks of Saskatchewan, there's not a lot of like high profile crimes that occur in Saskatchewan that are like connected with like when you think of Saskatchewan crime, there's not a whole lot that your mind will go to. Uh, this is a very major high profile crime, one of Canada's worst acts of mass murder. And I would think, I don't know, but I'm, I'm confidently confident in saying it's Canada's worst act of mass stabbing, like to, with a knife to kill 11 people and injure 17 others like that. And and for the most part done within an hour or so, two hours, maybe that is a very vicious, brutal, violent series of crimes to play out in your part of the country in Saskatchewan. Is this something that's been developing in the news over the last couple of years, over the last year or like what has been kind of the temperature of it? Like it was it was obviously massive news right when it happened. And then, you know, we'd get a little bit of sprinkled articles here and there. And then um, the full report was released a week or two ago. Mm-hmm. But I've got obviously a large portion of my following is from Saskatchewan. Mm-hmm. So even from the moment it happened up until a couple weeks ago, I I am always getting messages like, please cover James Smith Cree Nation stabbings. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to after after our series because now that all the info is out there and mm. it's it deserves to be talked about. Hell yeah. And it's it for so many reasons. Um how the RCMP handled it, um, how it was how the parole board handled it is another thing to get into. Uh it's it's I was shut again. I I followed it briefly at the beginning as it was all playing out up until the point that they eventually got him. Uh, I had no idea how brutal and horrific it was until over the last couple of days, I've been reading through this and putting, you know, our talking points and stuff together. I learned a lot, but I think I ultimately learned how absolutely horrific this is so the the way i see this is we're we'll divide our talk up at least into two parts tonight we'll talk about the the background leading up to the killing spree because a lot happens before people start dying then in our next episode which we'll record in upcoming days we'll cover the actual series of crimes leading up to the capture of the person responsible but to start with the background This all happens in September of 2022. You'll hear it described as happening on James James Smith Cree First Nation. But what I, as far as I can tell, that James Smith Cree First Nation isn't necessarily one place. It's like a community of of a couple small like towns or something. A population of about 2,000 people spread between two separate reserv- uh, reservations, I believe, is is what I saw. It's, it's certainly a small area. Have you ever heard of this place in this First Nation before this? Oh, definitely. Yeah. My dad actually worked out there. He built the school out there. Oh, really? Uh, back in 2000. Yeah. Wow. So, okay. okay. I'm, and it's, it's, it's quite a hike from Regina, like two, three hours. But yeah, I'm definitely familiar with it. Okay, so it's not unlike where I'm at in Halifax. It's about two hours or so to Portapique, where the mass shootings happened in Nova Scotia. So you kind of got a very similar thing going on. You're just a couple hours, uh, a couple hours away. Um, now, the the best way to cover the story, as far as providing a background on on the person responsible, uh, Miles Sanderson, is I thought by following along with a parole board decision that actually led to his release and him being able to do this crime because he was in prison he was in and out of prison 
his entire life, but just as it happened in February of 2022, so seven months before this mass stabbing, he was actually released on parole and it's uh, it set a lot into motion. So to talk a little bit about his background, I think I had just said he's a 32 year old man who had been in and out of prison his entire life. By the time of the killing spree in September of 2022, he had been convicted of 59 convictions. Most of them were violent in nature and roughly half of them related to breaches of release conditions or failure to, to comply with some kind of conditions related to, you know, his legal status. But I just think like when you look at him as an offender, he's proven time and time again that he doesn't follow rules and that he's violent to people close to him. Domestic violence, violence against others, 59 convictions at 32 years old is, I would say, prolific. That is a very busy, bad dude. That is staggering. And I'm not positive, but those 59 convictions pro were probably only from 18 on. They wouldn't count. They wouldn't count the ones when he was a minor. Oh yeah, would there even would the press even be able to like get access to them to include them in the count? Yeah, that's good. Exactly. Point. As I mentioned, he gets out on parole in February of 2022, months before this happens. He's in he's in prison for a pretty vicious and violent crime to begin with, and and I'm going to go into this a bit because it's important to. Um, kind of highlight the environment in the context of his release, given what he eventually does. So he was meeting with the parole board, um, seeking parole for his four year prison sentence that involved an assault, assault with a weapon, assaulting a police officer, uttering threats, mischief and robbery. He was serving four years. And I pulled some of the uh, some text out of the parole board decision, which which I read through and was quite shocking. But this gives a sense of what he was up to that put him in jail. So a 2017 incident in which Miles Sanderson forced his way into an ex girlfriend's home, talking about a gang and punched a he punched a hole in the bathroom door where her children were hiding in a bathtub. Once outside the home, he threw a cement block at her car. A few days later, the documents say Sanderson's threatened to murder a band store employee and burn down his parents' house. In 2018, he stabbed two men with a fork and beat another man until he lost consciousness. In June of that same year, he repeatedly kicked a police officer in the face while being taken into custody. So that string of crimes is what led to him getting a four-year prison sentence. In a lot of his justification or argument for being released is based on the fact that he had a difficult upbringing and that may have played into his his crime. Did you spend any time looking into, you know, this guy's background and, you know, what he grew up amongst because it's it's pretty brutal. Oh yes. Yeah, there's um it like in, intergenerational trauma is an absolutely real thing. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the he did he didn't have the best childhood in I wouldn't even say it was really good at all. Like he had he, one of the worst, <laughs> I yeah, would say. Uh, exactly. When you read a story like this or, or, or just follow a story like this, it's easy to look at the person responsible as a monster, especially in this case. But when you read through a parole board decision where they're examining the context of his, you know, his behavior, it's hard at some points to not feel bad for them. Like in this case, he was brought up raised to be in crime it seems there was drug abuse from a very early age neglect he bounced from one home to another never had a step a stable upbringing whatsoever at 14 years old he was already using cocaine and it's like you know that's pretty crazy but it's like a, it's hard to even imagine it because i i only know a stable home you know growing up i always had my house my parents you know, I was, there was food on the table. We were looked after. In his case, when I was reading through his background, he, not only did he move from host to host, he was moving from family to family or family member to family member, all the while surrounded with addiction, drug abuse, and neglect. And I can see how that would lead to a life of crime. If you grow up around violent crime, domestic abuse, 
you know, that's oftentimes sadly becomes a part of your life. But again, none of that explains what will eventually come well, from Miles Sanderson. And I think it's because, you know, we all know people who were brought up in trauma as well. Mm -hmm. Some people can break the cycle and others can't. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's hard, right? To sometimes you do feel bad for the guy, but it, it can't excuse what he did. We talked about him having 59 convictions, many of them related to not abiding by the pr prior conditions or breach of court orders, such. I've been talking about his February 20, 2022 parole board hearing, which he will eventually get out of prison with. But we should note that a couple months prior, he was actually paroled. He got out of prison on parole, but he breached the conditions of his release. I think he was the condition was he wasn't allowed to live with a woman, to live with a, a female without notifying his parole officer. But yeah. something happened that led to his girlfriend that he was living with contacting the police to say, he's here and he's living with me. And that led to them arresting him and revoking his parole. So he had already breached parole and got brought back into prison. February of 2022, he's back in front of the parole board pleading his case and he made a strong argument about doing a lot of like kind of like uh work on himself anger management reconnecting with his culture while in prison he had some as far as i could tell elders within his community who were supporting him as well and supporting his release um he made a a good case but i think just given someone's background and, and you know, uh, don't tell me who you are, show me sort of thing. I think right. he made a pretty strong case in his past behavior that maybe Miles Sanderson isn't ready to be a free man. Right. Well, and also, um, I think he wasn't per like he was paroled, but it was a it was a statutory like an automatic. Once you serve half your sentence, you're allowed to go. Yeah, I, I think like or in order be released to released or whatever. Yeah, because in I think the whole idea of that is in order to eventually become uh, you know rejo rejoin society. They don't want to just one day open the door of prison and be like you know get out there you're fine. They want you to you know have the experiences of being out and slowly working towards it. Yeah. So it looks like that was what was happening, but regardless, it uh, it wasn't working out. February 22, 2022 comes. He pleads his case and it is successful. Here's what the parole board's decision. I'm going to read a little bit of the parole board's decision. So when they release him, they say, it is the board's opinion that you will not present an undue risk to society if released on statutory release and that your release will contribute to the protection of society by, facilit by facilitating your reintegration to society as a law-abiding citizen. And that is despite their conclusion that he posed a high risk on a spousal assault risk assessment and a violent risk appraisal guide. So they do some kind of test to determine, are you a high risk to do something wrong? He scored high, like, yes, you're a high risk, but they still felt he should get his, you know, statutory release or however you put it and leave. I'm, I'm just so confused. Like, why? Why would you? And they do this all the time here. They release high risk to reoffend offenders yeah they do it here like, too it, you with guys a, yeah why <laughs> like you're just asking for trouble yeah they do that here in nova scotia as well there's usually like you'll see it in the news or something um you know uh just so you know there's this child predator who's at yes. a high risk to you know molest kids is free in your area and you're like that and seems then, like something's going wrong <laughs> Well, and just recently, um, like Regina police especially have been like, yeah, like this, you know, molester is now out. But this is just for public knowledge. We you, like don't uh, don't go after him. And it's like, <laughs> you guys, like you. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I will just I will never understand why well, they do that. Here's the thing as we as we when we wrap up this series of episodes about this case, uh, I think it makes a pretty strong case, a, a pretty strong argument for reconsidering the whole thing, because this guy gets out in February, and 
within no time at all, he stops meeting his parole officer and just goes off the grid. So he get, he gets out in, in February, but in May, Crime Stoppers issues an alert for Sanderson, Miles Sanderson, uh, and, and they simply describe him as being unlawfully at large. But what we know now is that he stopped right. meeting with his assigned caseworker. He he had to meet with them. I don't know if it was like weekly or whatever and check in. He just stopped meeting with them by May. Three months later, Crime Stoppers puts out a thing like, I don't know if there was a reward or what, but they put out uh, a notice like, you know, this we're looking for this guy. And just, well, as as he always does, he just doesn't abide by the conditions. And now he's in May, three months later, he's free, unlawfully doing his thing. Well, and even some of the conditions like, you know, you, you can't have a relationship with whoever, sexual or otherwise. It's like, you really think he's, I imagine he went, he got out of jail and went to his girlfriend's house. Yeah. Where else is he going to go? Mm-hmm. And, and yeah, it's it's as if the people making these decisions have absolutely no knowledge of how domestic violence works. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like not, it's, all of this is it seems like it's on the honor system for, for the most is. part. Yeah. Like pinky pinky promise us. Yeah. Without any surprise at all. During the time that from when he got released in February to May and leading up to the what he will eventually come to do. He spends most of his time bouncing between Saskatoon, where his girlfriend, her name is Vanessa, where Vanessa lives, and the John Smith Cree First Nation, where his brother Damien lives with his wife with his wife and three children. We should introduce a, a bit of of Damien, because he's he's gonna become a main character in this story. Is Damien is Miles's brother who seems to have a much more stable life. Damien lives on within the James Smith Cree First Nation, again with his wife and three children. His brother Miles is in and out. In and out, the unreliable yeah. one. It's it's pretty clear that Miles is the kind of wild one. And Damien seems uh, from reading what I've read about them both, Damien seems to have it together, but is willing to get a little wild when he's with his brother, is how he's I- e He's easily influenced by his brother. That's a very good way to put it. That ability to influence seems to really set this in motion. And I think we can start getting into the timeline of push coming to shove and, and the pieces falling into place for what will eventually happen. So just to recap the timeline again, February he's paroled or is released. May he stops checking in and there's the notice that they're looking for him. He's unlawfully at large. We're gonna pass through the summer and skip up to September 1st, which is just days before the killing spree. But this is really, I think, where the timeline begins because it's it's on or around September 1st that Miles, who had been in, in Saskatoon with his girlfriend Vanessa, arrives on the James, within the James Smith Cree First Nation. On September 1st, he arrives there with Vanessa, his girlfriend. She's driving and they have four children with them and they're coming to the First Nation with the plan of selling drugs, cocaine and otherwise. Um, since, and I've read interviews with, with Vanessa, Miles's, Miles's partner, she was aware of him selling the drugs, didn't necessarily support it, but at the same time, he was unlawfully at large, so he couldn't just get a job. So I think right. she was justifying it a little bit by being like, you know, he had to get money somehow and he couldn't just like take a job. He's basically on the run. So September 1st, they arrive with, with the plan to sell drugs. Of course, they have some support there because Miles's brother, who he's able to influence, Damien, is living in James Smith Cree First Nation. Uh, Damien's partner, his wife, her name is Skye. Damien and Skye, for the most part, were almost serving as like babysitters for while while Miles and Vanessa were you know going around and selling drugs or whatnot it's it's kind of a strange um, relationship they had but at least it was 
seem to be the I'd, case. I'd rather they drop the kids off first before don't bring them along. Yeah, yeah it's a, you know, I'll, they do bring them along when you're talking about bringing them along to the trauma and the horror of what's about to happen. So That's the, true. The day after they arrive, that Miles arrives on September 2nd, Damien and his wife, Sky are in bed sleeping, babysitting Miles and Vanessa's four kids. And Sky wakes up to the sound of Miles's children screaming for help, basically screaming bloody murder. Sky jumps out of bed, runs to the front window to see what the kids are screaming at. And what they see outside is Miles beating up his girlfriend, Vanessa, They're on the street. He's attacking her. And it's not like a verbal argument with pushing. Like I've seen photos for her. She was, you know, there was, it was a vicious beating of her. And it wasn't only a beating. He was actually getting in the vehicle as as Sky gets to the window. He was getting in her vehicle, trying to run her over as she's like in the street, having been beaten. Her kids are watching this. She's watching her brother-in-law try to run over his girlfriend. So she yells to her her husband, Damien, to be like, you know, your brother's outside attacking his girlfriend in front of the house and trying to run her over. Damien jumps out of bed and he runs outside to stop his brother from killing his girlfriend. And you kind of get a look at their relationship here because Miles turns his attention from his girlfriend that he's trying to kill to his brother and immediately directs his rage at his brother about things. Uh, I think some of the quotes are like, you know, you always think you're better than me. You're protecting these girls. You think you're better than me. You're no better than me. And I think that's kind of telling of maybe the, the relationship they had and how Miles uh, viewed it. There was a little bit of a resentment, it sounds like, mm. on Miles' part. Well, if, if your life is an absolute mess and your brother has like this place and this family and it's stable and you're in and you're on the run from your parole officer and crime stoppers. Yeah, I think I'd be a little jealous of my brother, too. Totally. Mm -hmm. um, Damien not only accepts kind of uh, Miles's rage, but he uses it as an opportunity to save Miles's girlfriend's life. What he does is as Miles is directing his rage at Damien. Damien gets Vanessa in her car, gets her to lock the door. Miles is running around the car trying to get in. And Vanessa drives off. She escapes, but not like, but in dramatic Good. fashion, like there's like trying to get in the car, bashing the windows sort of thing. And she takes off out of the situation but not only out of the situation, out of James Smith Cree First Nation, she like sh up and leaves, beaten, bloodied, almost run over by her own car. She leaves, but this puts Miles w without her in James Smith Cree First Nation. Uh, and who do you think he's going to turn to for help? The only one he can. Mm -hmm. The only one he knows will almost always accept him. Yeah, and I... I look at this moment as as pivotal, but I can I think I can understand it. Damien, Miles's brother, of course, is who he turns to. Miles, uh, Damien tells his wife, Skye, who doesn't approve of Damien's relationship with his brother. She knows Miles is trouble, but he basically goes to his wife and just says, like, I need to just get my brother out of here for a little bit. He's mad, like he's flipping out about this, you know, this breakup, this situation. I'm just going to, you know, go with him and try to calm him down. Damien and his brother Miles get in Sky's car to give Damien, uh, to give Miles a bit of time to cool off. And this is the last time Sky ever sees him. So it's like, we're going downhill fast. Yeah. And I like, and I'm sure what I, from what I read, Sky knew right away, th like, this is not good. This cannot be good. Yeah. And she, um, in the, in, I, I said, Vanessa, Miles's partner, um, she had given an interview to Global News. So did Sky. And it was, it was really fascinating to read through her discussing this part in particular and, and just the way that Miles's problems often become, you know, Maya and Damien's problems. This moment, I think, 
given Miles's world being kind of twisted upside down. He's in. He's here selling cocaine. You know, now my husband's gone with him in my car. You know what's going to happen? Initially, at least, Sky is able to text her husband Damien and carry out a conversation and follow along with what he's up to. I don't know how much she knows, but we know now that pretty much immediately after leaving, Damien and Miles continued to sell drugs together now, Damien driving them, but not only selling drugs, they were drinking and taking drugs themselves. So I guess if, if this starts as a party, the party's kind of rolling right off the bat with hard drugs, alcohol, domestic violence kicking the whole thing off it's already bad yeah. and, and it immediately gets worse it immediately turns from selling drugs doing drugs and drinking to like intimidating people threatening people and just freaking people out in the community and it did escalate quite quickly but i can't imagine sky or anyone else in the community could have ever predicted what was to unfold they knew miles was trouble that was no secret but i don't think anyone could have predicted what what was to come yeah i think even as it starts happening they can't predict it and no. they don't understand i think each person who's encountering them as we get into it don't realize what just happened before and what's just about to happen it's like a yeah. million isolated bizarre encounters with him but when you're when you look at it one after another you realize like whoa like these people are about to go on an absolute rampage um so let's jump ahead a little bit so we've just been talking so september 1st he arrives september in with the plan of selling cocaine and other drugs september 2nd miles has he beats up vanessa she flees miles and damien leave together in damien's wife's car they're selling drugs, doing drugs, and drinking. Sky has never said exactly what he was saying to her, but she did say that at some point during the day, he seemed to turn on me and then stop responding to me. So something weird was sent from him to her, and then he cuts off communication with her. And that may be what makes her realize like something really bad's happening and I need to get my husband home. What she does, the way she, she tries to facilitate that is on September 3rd at 4 a.m., so early in the morning, she calls 911 to report her car stolen. Because again, Damien and Miles have her car. She wants them to come home. She wants the car back. He's not answering her texts anymore. She calls 911 to report the car stolen, Say who says who has it. She tells the police as well on that 911 call that he has a warrant out for him. She knew that Damien had an active warrant so that she's giving the police justification to not only get my car, but just get him off the streets and put him in you know jail or whatever to get his brother out of here is, is what yeah. she's thinking. Uh, she is also pleading with the 911 operator like, I want to make this anonymous. I don't want to tell you my name. I don't want to tell you anything. Find him. Find my car. He has a warrant put him in jail. She's trying to save him from himself. I think that's a sign that she knew something was not right more than just, you know, not him not responding to texts. Uh, as I said, they were they were already gaining a reputation or people were were becoming aware that they were traveling around the community acting threatening and, you know, being wild, wild and out basically. She was trying to put a stop to that. To their credit, the RCMP do take the complaint semi semi seriously. About fifteen minutes after that nine one one call, they respond to the area, searching for Damien. Uh, there's no reference to Miles on the nine one one call. She didn't say anything about the brother. Oh, she's just like she's just I thought like, she had. I thought she reported both of them. No, she was just reporting oh, okay. her, her husband. Uh, so they're they're looking for Damien at four fifteen. At 5.30 a.m., they find the vehicle at a random house. And it's not like there's a house party, but there's a couple people in this house hanging out on couches and whatnot. Her car that's reported stolen is in the driveway. 
So the police enter their home, enter the home, and I think this moment is also going to be one that people really look at. If the parole board missed their opportunity to keep him in prison, these RCMP officers and the procedures that put them in this position kind of miss an opportunity to put a stop to it at this point as well. What happens in the house? So the police go in and they're talking to a few people, but the photo they had of Damien was like eight or 10 years old. Mm -hmm. So he looked nothing like his, I'm assuming mugshot. Mm -hmm. And they spoke to Damien, but he gave them a different name. I believe he gave them like one of his cousin's names mm -hmm. and they were like, okay, mm -hmm. we're going to take this car back to its owner and you guys have a good night. Yeah. Like, and not only was the key or was the car outside, they found the keys in the house as well. And so they asked the people in the house, like, why are the keys here for this stolen car? And they're just, they're like, like oh, I don't know. <laughs> and so they, they go took ahead the and keys. take it. <laughs> yeah. It's not ours. So they, they took the keys and left after, yeah, again, talking to Damien and miles was in the house as well. Um, but like you said, the photo, like this is all happening in September of 2022. The photo they had of Miles was a mugshot photo of 2014. So eight years okay. prior. And when you're talking about a 30 year old, you know, eight years, you'll change your looks, right? Absolutely. And yeah. maybe I'm a little bit too critical on police, but you can't tell me that these RCMP officers were not at least familiar with Miles. He, he, think, was, right? he was not only un unlawfully at large at the time. He had 59 convictions. He had 59 convictions. You're after his brother, Damien Sanderson. Look around. Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe Miles is there. Maybe you can kill two birds with one stone here. But I yeah, don't that's know. right. Because he was unlawfully at large. Like, it, did they not kind of look into that call? Like, hmm. Exactly. So that's, I'm a little bit. I'm like, did the police really take this seriously? Mm, or did they just show up and do the bare minimum? Yeah, I think they're going to have some explaining to do. They're, yeah. Certainly. Because um, there is an inquest into this coming where that's, I don't think it's a full public inquiry, but. Well, I mean, like, he's a violent offender. Do you really not care about the other citizens that much? Mm. I think their defense, the the because a lot of this information is coming from the police press conference. They made a point in the press conference of saying that nine one one call did not mention Miles Sanderson, so we had he wasn't like we weren't considering him when we went there. I guess, but I don't know. I'm, I'm not taking the side of the RCMP. <laughs> I'm on Team Madeline in this one, <laughs> certainly. Um, but whatever the reason for it. At 5.30 a.m. when they find Miles and Damien and get fake names, they move on, leaving these two to continue selling cocaine in a community of 2,000 people, intimidating people, drinking, and taking drugs. So let's jump ahead 12 hours. So this morning, that morning, they managed to sneak past the police. At 5 p.m., things really start ramping up. Uh, Miles... He, it, it seems like throughout this story, he begins to turn on anyone he who's associated with him through the sale of drugs. And it seems like he's like paranoid or suspicious of everybody. And he starts to target people. One person he targets more than one time in the story is a 28 year old in the community named Greg Burns. At 5 p.m., Miles tells someone I, I, he shows up at a house and I think he says, like, I think this may be an exact quote. He says, like, I'm here for one body, Greg Burns. Like, get him here. And the person who owns that house writes Greg a message and says, why don't you come over here? When Greg, 28-year-old Greg Burns arrives, he's being driven there by his best friend, whose name is Creedon DiPaolo, I think is how the, the last name is pronounced. As Creedon shows up at the house with Greg in, in the car, they pull up out front, Greg hops out of the car, and immediately Miles charges at Greg and begins attacking him. A, a brutal, violent assault. Creedon just watches his best friend get the tar beat out of him, for lack of a better word. 
which is a complete surprise. They weren't expecting it. After the assault stops, uh, Greg gets up off the ground and walks back to the car, injured, bleeding, like badly beaten. And he tells Creedon, his best friend, like, you, you just go home. I'm going inside the house and like, I'm going to be okay. We'll, we'll talk later today. And the two brothers standing outside, having just beat him up, they, and this doesn't make logical sense to me. I don't understand how this happens, but what they end up doing is getting in the car with Creedon, threatening him saying, we're going to beat you up if you don't drive us around. And what we have to remember is they were drunk and high. It like, sure sounds it. They were, yeah, paranoid, whatever. They were not. And Miles, even when he was sober, doesn't sound super uh, stable. Yeah. And so add drugs and alcohol, good grief. It gets even weirder, though, because when they get in the car, not only are they threatening him, him like, we'll beat you up if you don't, you know, take us around. They're grilling him about their suspicion that he's a member of this street gang called the terror squad. They're like, are you a member of terror squad? And Creedon is like, no, I'm not a member of this like notorious street gang. And then what Miles says is like, well, if you're not, we believe you take us for a drive. We want to go around here looking for members of this gang. Do you, have you ever heard of terror squad? Does that, as someone from Saskatchewan, does that mean something to you? I, I have heard of, well, it's, isn't that fat Joe's band? Do you remember the rapper Fat Joe? I'm pretty sure he was part of the Terror Squad, but um, I'm pretty sure, like it's a gang, but I'm sure it's out of Saskatoon. Yeah, I think so. That... I'm not sure why they were there looking for members. That's what I had read is that it's a, like a street gang involved in like street level organized crime, primarily in Saskatoon. There's pro they probably have some connection to this place, but Obviously. it's not like there's like Terror Squad members marching around the james smith creek first nation no. yeah um, the way it Why works yeah exactly the, the way it works is damien's in the front seat of the car creedence driving miles is in the back seat they are driving around the community of two thousand people like this rural saskatchewan community i think for about an hour they drive around with plans of beating up any terror squad members they find Turns out they don't find any. Uh, I'm I'm confident that this entire time, Creedon, who just watched them beat the crap out of his best friend, is probably like, I want to get the hell out of here. He manages to do that by simply saying, like, I gotta go home and shower. Like, I'm can I I'm gonna drop you guys off. I'm gonna go home and shower and I'll be back to, you know, I'll come back later and pick you guys up and we'll continue this mission. Uh, I think he's probably pretty relieved when when they accept that. Right. That, oh, that would be the best feeling. You're like, oh, okay, see you later. Yeah, it's like, see. Out of there. See ya. This is another pivotal moment. There's so many moments in this that it's, it's just like to go through them, it's just wild. But when they get out of Creedence car, the two brothers split up. And this moment I think is very interesting and important because we're gonna talk more about what role Damon play Damien plays in this story. It's something that I think, well, to this day, I think no one knows. I don't know if we'll ever know, but this moment is telling. So the two brothers split up. Miles goes off doing his thing, selling drugs. Damien ends up going, who's already drinking at this point, go, ends up going to a bar in one of the small communities within the James Smith Cree First Nation. And he's just sitting at the bar drinking. It's like early evening. And he gets into a conversation with a woman at the bar that he knows. And she has re reported that what he was talking about was that Damien was telling her that he's on a mission. And he has an important mission to do and with his brother and that people in the community are going to hear about it in the next few hours. So I think, you know, in the context of this story, it seems like Damien is involved in whatever they're planning not only involved in it but they're actually you know planning to do something that they see as a mission that is going to be uh impactful enough that people are going to hear about it on the news or wherever what do you make of this moment it's it's ominous and scary to us now but i imagine i imagine the woman he was talking to was like yeah okay you're all you, talk you drunk fool exactly like something like that yeah something along the lines like like i said before absolutely no one 
could have predicted that that was the mission what they what they eventually ended up yeah yeah well, doing well then that's the question they or him right there's, there's the other thing is what role damien has in it but whatever role he ends up having in it at least at this point it, he's talking about a mission to carry out with his brother that people are going to hear about um this is the evening shortly before midnight a couple hours later fatefully um damien ends up meeting up with his, with his brother again and it's gone from bad to worse uh when they meet up it's they're back on the terror they assault a man they steal a dodge caravan and continue to sell drugs take drugs and drink from the dodge caravan they meet with a, a variety of people doing these drug trade the the drug deals that night the last known drug deal they make involve like they were still driving the stolen dodge caravan it was at 4 a.m that night so just you know uh, just a couple hours later that's the last known sale they were spotted about 45 minutes later at a house so they a house where other people were so it seems like there's they're kind of going from like drug deal to drug deal but also kind of socializing as they go with people partying and drinking and hanging out uh being aggressive and intimidating but at this particular time a little after 4 a.m they were seen on their own like in the corner of the room actually guzzling booze and kind of pumping each other up to do something as like almost like they had a big game coming up like we got this we got this you know like rallying uh. they do this in the house and other people witness this then they just get up without saying anything that's been reported leave and get in the dodge caravan and it's at this moment that the police in their press conference say it's at this moment when the killing spree starts so we're at september 4th very early in the morning you know just before 5 a.m in the morning the brothers have had this kind of whirlwind two days together they're drunk high in a stolen car it doesn't seem like they've and slept in a couple up. days yeah and fired up in when we get into the conversation in the next episode, when we actually go through the timeline of what happens, we will need to talk for an hour to go through what happens within the next like hour <laughs> of this story. Like it, it is shocking what one slash two, one and a half people can do with, there's no firearms in, in the story. Yeah. Yeah. And there's no firearms too, which is something like when, as I'm reading this story, I'm always comparing and contrasting with the Nova Scotia mass casualty that happened in port in 2020 um, in Nova Scotia. But in that case, it's like automatic high powered weapons. In this case, it's two drunk stone guys in a stolen vehicle. And what they're able to do in, in a community going house to house is just unimaginable even as i read the timeline i'm like that doesn't make sense but it's well and when you when you do look at the timeline it's mere minutes in mm -hmm. each house yeah as i was taking yeah. the, the notes for what will be our next episode it's like yeah I, I generally if i'm doing a covering a story that involves a timeline i try to do like hour to half hour in this one it's like you know at 5 16 at 5 17 to 19. You know, it's, 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 it's that crazy. Exactly. And to call it a rampage, to call it a massacre is not understating it. But at this point, what we know about this story, I think the two moments that people are going to look back on is the parole board's decision and the RCMP flubbing the one call for help. At this point, there has not been, other than that one call, there has not been any other calls to police about nope. about them despite this crazy situation uh beating up greg burns you know no police calls but i guess you know if you live in a rural remote first nations community you're probably not too quick to call the rcmp and i guess as we you're also see, not too trusting of them that makes with, a lot of with sense with their history mm. i i wouldn't trust them either yeah so, and yeah. i guess as we see from when sky called the police i don't know what difference it would have made 
exactly. they show back up with a you know the eight year old photo like is this the guy I, f- I feel like if they even tried a little bit harder they could have been like hmm, maybe that is him but hindsight's 2020 so yeah you never um, know what I'm wondering is because it was Damien that said in the bar like yeah we're you know we're gonna do something big but I'm just I have this feeling that Miles planned something with Damien to Damien's knowledge but Miles had something else planned in in the back of his head mm-hmm. I don't think Damien knew about maybe all of Miles's ideas yeah well as we'll get into the timeline it does look at some point that there is a a change in or at least a disagreement between the two of them about how this is going to go down and what exactly is going to go down and it will change kind of the direction of the story for sure but miles has had i guess you'd call them homicidal tendencies when you look at when you look at his past there's tons of violence including threats to kill uh his partner vanessa He had talked about wanting to kill his girlfriend. He had, I think, acted on threats to try to kill her parents with a knife. He was going to stab them. So it's like he's a like he's a dangerous guy. And I'm sure the parole board knows that when you read through his background or hear these reports from, you know, he's beating up Vanessa, threatening to kill her, threatening to kill her parents. Well, and I just don't understand how even with just Vanessa, how he's never caught a attempted murder charge. Mm-hmm. Trying to run someone down is an attempted murder. In the like, it's, it's even, not just assault. I'm I'm surprised. Like maybe I'm like blessed thinking that this this it's this utopian world, but to beat up someone and try to run them down in the street in broad daylight and the cops aren't called. Yeah, it's. Uh, but I, you know, I guess they just thought, you know, that's that was just a fight. Yeah, and it's kind of nothing, within the family as well. No, like nothing to call the cops over, but yeah, I don't know. Well, we weren't I, yeah. there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I guess Damien kind of went with him. Like I'm going to calm him down. And when that kind of turned weird, that was when Sky did call the police. You're right. When he wasn't, yeah, returning her phone calls or text messages or whatever. Yeah. But and yeah. then that also makes you think like, that's that kind of fight is the norm. That wasn't an assault or an attempted murder. Yeah, it was a, it was an argument. It was a fight. So yeah, that, which is yeah, that's so an, unfortunate. Yeah, that in that the kids see that th- this whole idea with the cycle of you know of abuse. You know those mm-hmm. kids are seeing their dad beat up and try to run down their mom, this girl, their mom outside, like, and you know I'm staying. It's that's awful, but it's unimaginable. Yeah, and those kids are going to be around for what's to come in the second part of this discussion. You know, the the kids are party to a lot of that as well, which is really horrific. It adds um, another just tragic layer onto something already so horrific and tragic. Yeah, well, we'll start wrapping up this part because I think uh, we're right on the cusp of getting into what happens. And I don't want to open that door because there's a lot of conversation uh, we'll be to, here for another couple hours. So. Yeah, that's that's a big one. But we'll um making it a point that this will come out, and then just days later, part two will come out, so people won't have to wait for you know if you if you don't know the story, and even for people who do know the story, uh, I think um the the police press conference filled in a lot of blanks that people had. I didn't know almost all of what I've learned by going through that, and it's so much worse than I ever would have imagined. I thought I knew the gist of it, and I I only knew about the tip of the iceberg. Like it's, yeah, it's, um, it, it runs pretty deep and it's unbelievably just heart shattering. Yeah. Well, before we wrap it up, anything you want to tease that you're working on? I know you, you mentioned you're planning to do a video about this. I think it's a great idea, but I don't know how you're going to fit this into one of your videos because you're usually like, you know, 15, 20 minutes, right, would be typical right. for you. I'll probably do it in one full video. It'll just be a little bit longer, but uh, that'll be probably next week or the week after. Um, I took a little bit of a hiatus last week. I just was like so tired and couldn't get my head in the game. So I didn't Mm. post anything last week, but I'm this Tuesday. I'm posting about Alan Legere, who you told me about. Yeah. Yeah. 
Mm. So, and it's, I've got close ties to New Brunswick and even Miramichi, and I had never heard of him before. Really? You told me, no, you're the first one that told me about him. So. Wow. Yeah. I'm shocked by that, but it's, it's just goes to show these stories, they stick in their little area. Like there's yeah. a lot of people around Canada who probably don't know what happened in Saskatchewan. They may be, oh, like I heard something about that. It and rings a bell. Ten but... years now, they no one will have a clue. Yeah, my mom knows about Alan Legier, but my dad didn't. Wow. Okay. Well, I have so my actually. My mom's a true primer, so. Um, I have. Um, someone had sent me. They had collected newspapers, and they sent me all the newspapers from when that happened. Oh, like cool. it's a big thing of them it's crazy to see that but wow. yeah, i'll have to check out your video on it although he gives me like i get i have like ptsd from the christmas card he sent me so that, was cool. that is so unhinged like yeah. i couldn't i couldn't imagine yeah it was something That's, else that was something yeah. else for sure and yeah um, he's still alive which is unfortunate and surprised me yeah but, uh, i'll yeah. agree with that um you were talking about you didn't post last week and you were run down or whatever it was i i get the same thing whenever i go on vacation it's like it's pointless because it's not a big i i say it's not a vacation it's a trip i go on trips because i come back yeah. and i'm exhausted and i need a vacation but no you got to get right back to work it's like oh my god what did i do to myself I should have taken the Monday off. And like I got back on, I left on a Sunday, the April 30th, and then we got back early morning Friday. So it's not even like, like I had the whole weekend as a buffer, but I should have taken that Monday. It was just, it was a rough one. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're back and I'm glad we can get back to the important work we do here, looking Me at too. these horrific cases. Yeah, it's it hasn't been fun, but it's been informative. I want to thank you for joining Madeline and I for this episode of Nighttime. Now you won't need to wait long for the second part in this series. It should be released within just two days of the release of this episode. Now I'm going to start wrapping up this episode, but before we part, I'm going to give some thanks. First, a big thanks to Monty Data for contributing the music for this episode. A shout out to LJ from the Dystopian Simulation podcast who provides my intro and outro voiceovers. And lastly, but most importantly, a massive thank you goes out to every one of you listening to Nighttime as without your interest and your support, this show would be as pointless as it would be impossible. Now on the topic of support, let me thank the newest subscribers to the premium feed. Second Line Parade and Craig, thank you for your generous support. And for anyone else who'd like to support the show, you can help by simply sharing this episode on social media and letting your like-minded friends know what we're doing here. If anyone listening has any story ideas or wants to give feedback on the show, you can reach me at nighttimepodcast.com slash contact. I hope to hear from you. But until then, take care of each other, hug your loved ones tight, and let me know if you see anything weird. The Nighttime Podcast is written, hosted, and produced by Jordan Bonaparte.